Good morning, everyone. My name is Caroline Goon, and I'm an advisor for the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. I'm also the lead designated federal officer for the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, which I will here and out refer to as the commission. First, happy Pi Day, but also happy <laughs> Women's History Month. <laughs> This month, March, is set aside to honor women's contributions in American history. And many of those sitting around these tables today will no doubt leave an enduring legacy marked not only by the work being done in this room today, but also outside of these walls. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the first commission meeting of 2023 and our fifth meeting of the commission since our commissioners were sworn in last February. Since our last meeting in December, our commissioners have been hard at work, deliberating on recommendations that will be shared in detail with the full commission and the public over the course of the meeting today. Thank you again to our distinguished commissioners for continuing to share your time, expertise, and knowledge. As you may be aware, this is a federal advisory committee and it operates under the regulations set forth by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. The, the advisory committee process ensures independent review in an open and public manner with opportunities for public participation. In order to make sure that all voices are heard, we need your cooperation in coordinating communications with the commission. For our community members and partners that are watching this meeting via YouTube live stream, welcome. We are so happy to have you. This broadcast includes uh, American Sign Language interpreters as well as closed captioning. We will not be having oral comments at this meeting. However, you may submit written comments to our email address, anpcommission at hhs.gov. That's spelled A-A-N-H-P-I commission at hhs.gov. We want to ensure a public and transparent process and we want to hear from you. Your messages will be shared with the commission for their consideration. If any members of the commission are contacted by external special interest groups, please refer the contact to the WIANPI team. We will arrange to share the information with the full commission. I also invite everyone to visit our website at hhs.gov backslash about backslash WIANPI. That's W-H-I-A-A-N-H-P-I. There you can find information about the commission, the commission's charter, commissioner biographies, and meeting materials. We will also announce upcoming meetings uh, on our website with the dates and times as well as through the Federal Register notice. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ms. Crystal Kai. Crystal is the Executive Director of WIANPI and the Commission. She's also the first Native Hawaiian to be appointed to this role, where she is responsible for advising the Biden-Harris administration on the coordination and implementation of federal programs, policies, and initiatives to advance economic equity, uh, justice, and opportunity uh, for our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. Crystal, I am so grateful for your selfless leadership, and our communities are lucky to have you. Crystal? Thank you for that kind introduction, Caroline, and good morning, aloha everyone. As the Executive Director of the White House Initiative and the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, it is my honor to welcome you to the fifth public meeting of the President's Advisory Commission. Our commissioners were sworn in by Vice President Harris in February of 2022, and in just a little over a year, this commission has already accomplished so much thanks to the hard work and dedication of our 25 commissioners, whose leadership, expertise, and lived experiences are a reflection of the rich diversity of our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. Since the commission's inaugural meeting in February 2022, the commission has formed six subcommittees that have been meeting bi-weekly to learn from subject matter experts and to craft recommendations that they have been submitting to the president on a rolling basis um, to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for our AA and NHPI communities all across the nation. And um, earlier this year, the White House actually released its first ever national strategy to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for AA and NHPIs. This massive effort could not have been done without our colleagues and leaders across the federal government, including 32 federal agencies that submitted plans um, to advance equity for our communities. And many of these plans were informed by the work of this very commission, as well as from stakeholders, many of you tuning in today, and organizations all across the country who have really helped to ensure that we are being responsive to the needs of our diverse communities. 
Earlier this year, we were also excited to announce the kickoff of our regional economic series, which was a recommendation that came out of this very commission uh, to the administration, to the president, to ensure that we were doing more uh, to connect local communities and small businesses and entrepreneurs with local um, resources, as well as federal resources all across the country. So we kicked this off in Philadelphia in January. We were so honored to be joined by our uh, co-chair, Ambassador Catherine Tai, who you will be hearing from shortly, as well as Small Business Administrator Isabel Guzman and uh, we actually just had an event in Chicago and we'll be in Seattle later this month so we are uh, really gearing up and this again would not have been possible without the recommendation of our commissioners many of whom have been present at our summits. Um, another recommendation from the Commission that Secretary Javier Becerra mentioned during our last meeting is uh, we are going to be gearing up to plan a mental health summit. This was again a recommendation that came directly from this Commission. So we are seeing that in real time as the commissioners are submitting recommendations and they are being greenlit that we are able to actually implement so many of these um, really truly instrumental ways to connect federal resources with our communities all across the country. Um, our commissioners, to all of you, I just want to say thank you for your unwavering dedication to serving the American people and our AA and NHPI communities and ensuring that the voices of those who have been historically underserved and underrepresented are elevated at the highest levels of government. And I especially want to thank the leadership of our co-chairs, uh, U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Catherine Tai, as well as Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra, um, and our commissioner, our chief commissioner, Sonal Shaw, who um, does a masterful job of moderating and um, leading these meetings. Uh, again, all of you have provided such invaluable support, guidance, and leadership um, that have truly helped to make a difference and an impact in such a short amount of time. I also want to give recognition to um, so many of our staff behind the scenes who, you know, who have been working really hard to make this happen. In particular, our White House Initiative Deputy Director, Rebecca Lee, um, our Commission's designated federal officers, Caroline Goon, who you just heard from, Sarah Edwards, and Zayan Wu. And of course, a big thanks to our colleague, Erica Moritzugu in the White House, who serves as a Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Liaison to the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community. Erica is actually staffing the President today. He will be in Monterey Park. And so we are grateful to have her joining us via Zoom. Um, and I wanna also thank Erica's team, in particular, Hannah Kim, who has been so uh, instrumental to the work of uh, this commission as well. And, and Georgette Furukawa. So thank you again to all of you. We know that we have a busy day ahead. Um, we have lots of work to do as well um, in the coming months before this commission's term ends. But again, we are really just so impressed and gratified by the hard work that we have already seen um, play, uh, paying off in terms of the implementation of so many of your recommendations and look forward to a productive session ahead. Um, so next, it is my honor to introduce our commission co-chair, Ambassador Catherine Tai. Ambassador Tai serves as the 19th United States Trade Representative and is one of three, soon to be four, Asian Americans in the President's Cabinet. In this role, she serves as Principal Trade Advisor, Negotiator, and Spokesperson on U.S. Trade Policy for the President. Ambassador Tai is a shining example of leadership for our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities, and we are grateful for her tremendous leadership and all that she has done to break down barriers and champion policies that center communities that have been historically underrepresented. So Ambassador Tai, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Crystal, for that kind introduction, and it's wonderful to be here with all of you again. Um, I'm uh, amazed that this is the fifth public meeting of the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. And um, uh, thinking back to um, the first meeting that we had in person here, um, <clears throat> uh, I feel the, the buzz in the room and the rapport has really grown. Uh, over the course of your work, I want to thank you and congratulate you on um, everything that you are uh, working with us to accomplish. It is my joy and honor to serve as co-chair of this commission alongside HHS Secretary Javier Becerra. I am deeply grateful to each of you for your service and dedication. I especially want to thank Crystal, Rebecca, Erica, our DFOs, and the entire WeOnPi team for making this meeting possible and making all of this work uh, go. Um, so much has happened since we last met in December. Things to celebrate, 
Um, it is uh, just um, today, it's Tuesday, two days after uh, the Oscars, um, which uh, was a record-breaking, barrier-breaking Oscars for uh, Asian America, something that I'm eager to talk to our commissioner, Daniel Day Kim, about. <laughs> So when, during the break, okay. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time, um, we know that uh, times are still extremely challenging for all of us and for the AA and HPI community. In January, as many Asian Americans were celebrating the Lunar New Year, tragedy struck our community again with mass shootings in Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay, California. The administration immediately deployed our own Erica Moritsugu to be on the ground in Monterey Park after the shootings with the vice president following a day later. President Biden today is in Monterey Park to meet with families and community affected uh, by those shootings. Um, as Carolyn noted that today is Pi Day, it's March 14th. <clears throat> Uh, if we think back to where we were two years ago on March 16th, it will be the two-year anniversary of the Atlanta spa shootings. Um, another um, attack that rocked our community. Despite these tragedies, we continue to see the resilience of our community, including heroes like Bran um, from Monterey Park. I got a chance to meet Bran when he was in town for uh, the President's State of the Union address. I was incredibly moved to hear him speak. Um, I speak every day, and uh, we were joking that for me, you know, an action shot is a picture of me talking. Um, I was so incredibly touched. I just wanted to share with you. Um, Bran uh, came to Washington, was invited up to the Hill, gave some remarks, and um, he's a young man who doesn't do this every day. Um, and uh, you know, as he, the, just the sincerity of his presentation, recounting an extremely traumatic event, uh, when um, Congresswoman Judy Chu asked him at the end, you know, what he took away from this experience, um, he shared with us, he said, I just want all of you to know that um, what he learned was that there is incredible courage in all of us that we might not even know we have, <clears throat> but that in a moment of crisis, when we are called upon um, to have the confidence that you have the courage inside of you to make that difference. And um, I carry with me that incredibly uh, sincere uh, and uh, um, honest reflection uh, that Bran shared with us that day. Um, I think it's also really important for us to rem remember and recall because we know we are stronger when we come together. Even through these tragedies, we will emerge as a sturdier, tighter community, more confident in our courage and our resilience and our ab ability to contribute. Our administration, I want to assure you, will continue to partner with AA and NHPI communities everywhere to fight for justice and equity and build a society that is freer and fairer. As Crystal mentioned earlier this year, the administration released its first ever national strategy to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for AA and NHPI communities. I also want to note that on the very first day of this month, which is Women's History Month, President Biden nominated Julie Su to be the nation's next Secretary of Labor, the fourth Asian American woman to serve in his cabinet. I want you to know that this commission's efforts are directly affecting the administration's work. If by chance, for those of you who were working on the commission, it is hard for you to tell because you are inside of the commission. A great example of this impact was the inaugural White House initiative on ANNHPI Economic Summit in Philadelphia. The summit demonstrated how your recommendations are having a concrete and real impact on people's lives, and it was also great to see some of you there. As President Biden said in his State of the Union address, we must all do our part to meet the challenges of our time, to craft intentional, inclusive policies that generate long-term and equitable economic prosperity, 
to uplift communities that have been underserved and historically overlooked, to build a better America by investing in ourselves, in our communities, and our small businesses. As the US Trade Representative, I want you to know that trade policy plays an important role in realizing this vision. USTR was one of 32 federal agencies that created action plans to implement the administration's national AA and NHPI strategy. Our plan at USTR includes items that your subcommittees are examining closely. For example, advancing data disaggregation to better understand the distributional effects of trade and trade policy on American workers. The findings confirmed that literature and data gaps are extremely stark especially when it comes to AA and NHPI workers. So it is clear we have more work to do and that this is really important work. That's one of the reasons why I've made it a priority to put the US back into USTR. Whenever I travel, I make it a priority to meet with small businesses and AA and NHPI leaders across the country and I'll be doing exactly that uh, later this week. Their stories emphasize the human impacts of my work as US Trade Representative. I am inspired by their stories always and their stories of resilience and ingenuity. I also want to share with you that when I travel internationally, it is very clear to me how our diaspora communities, and in particular our AA and HPI communities too, uh, are incredible resources and assets of the United States as a globally connected nation. When I am in the Asia Pacific, when I travel in the Americas, um, it is inspiring to me the people to people connectivity that we have through our communities with the rest of the world and that these communities are um, important bridges and bridge builders for the work that we have to do internationally um, uh, as part of our economic and foreign policy. As I close, I want to say again that this commission is integral to this administration's efforts to advance equity, tackle anti-Asian violence, ensure inclusion and belonging, and build an economy for all Americans. Your work is so critical in our fight to form a more perfect union. One not based on violence and division, but on unity, peace, and prosperity for all of our communities. As you enter your second year as commissioners, I hope you can see the many ways that your service is affecting people's lives. I'm grateful to each and every one of you for serving as partners in this endeavor. Today's meeting is another opportunity to build on our progress. I look forward to reading the recommendations that you approve today. Thank you, thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Erica Moritsugu, our phenomenal leader at the White House, who uh, I see on screen and I'm eager to hear from. Thank you so much. grateful for your tireless leadership and for all that you do to advance the priorities of the Asian Americans. Data points of Pacific Islander communities. I'm so sorry I can't join you at the White House today. I was really looking forward to welcoming you in person. Um, but I will be with the President today in Monterey Park, California, where he'll reaffirm his commitment to reducing gun violence and offer his support to impacted families, state and local leaders, and first responders following the mass shooting here at the local dance studio and shook our entire community in the nation. As, as the ambassador mentioned, I, I have the solemn honor of representing the administration on the grounds of Monterey Park in the immediate aftermath of the shooting to grieve with the community at vigils, deliver the president's letter to the community, and accompany the vice president as she met with the families of the victims and reaffirmed the administration's commitment to provide federal resources to the AA and NHPI communities. It's humbling to be back here with the president. I wish it was for a more cheerful occasion. However, the president's visit to Monterey Park today in recognition of our community's resilience and its pain shows our community, I hope, that in the country and the world that tragedy does not define us. I'm proud that our president truly cares about our communities and sees us. 
I'm sure he would have loved to meet and met you all today and find so much hope, knowing you're working so hard to improve the lives of the AA and NHPI communities, including finding ways to promote belonging and inclusion and address anti-Asian hate and discrimination, expand language access, build better data, and cultivate more community partnerships. Because all of this is so critical to our communities, including those impacted in Monterey Park and in Atlanta, where we'll soon mark another anniversary of the slaughters. Your work will be crucial in uplifting our brothers and sisters, whether in the aftermath of a mass shooting or an unreported hate incident, as we build unity and resilience we heal and rise stronger together. So thank you, commissioners. Thank you for your leadership and efforts. I've had the pleasure of working with you for more than a year now. And I know each of you shares the president's day one commitment to meet the needs of underserved communities so that all Americans can thrive and share in our nation's prosperity. By now you've seen this administration implement many of your recommendations and we look to you to hold us accountable. We truly appreciate you for lending your stories, experiences, and expertise, time, and your feedback is needed as we work to advance the administration's whole government equity strategy. On his first day in office, President Biden initiated an executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. And since day one, this administration has centered equity in everything we do. Just in the last month, President Biden signed a second executive order to strengthen the administration's equity mandate and formalize his goal of increasing the share of federal contracting dollars awarded to small disadvantaged businesses by 50% by 2025. And as has been mentioned, the president recently nominated the Honorable Julie Sue to serve as our country's next Secretary of Labor. Julie is a lifelong champion for workers and a proud daughter of immigrants from China. She is the embodiment of the American dream, as the president said. And we're gonna have another champion in Julie as a cabinet member. So as we enter the second year of your term, we will continue to seek your guidance and labor of love. You've already been one of the most active and effective commissions to date. I can't mind me saying so. The impact of your recommendations and advice to the president is being felt across all levels of this administration. And as I've mentioned in previous meetings, we do not do this work alone. Not only do you have the help of our good friends and colleagues at the White House Initiative on AAN and HPIs, but you have the full support of President Biden, Vice President Harris, and this White House. Thank you so much for being in partnership with us. I look forward to seeing the recommendations that you consider today. Mahalo Nui for sharing this space. I hope to see you in person soon. And with that, I'll turn things over to our Chief Commissioner, Sonal Shah, He's going to lay out the commission's charge and goals. So all over to you. Well, thank you, Erica. Um, we're sorry to miss you here, but we're glad that you're in California with the president. So it's an important it's an important visit, and it's important and a gratefulness to the uh, to the president and the vice president for having made the effort to go out there to go and meet with the communities. It's critical. Um, okay, so all the fun stuff is over. <laughs> now we get to do all the hard work. Uh, it is going to be going through um, each of our recommendations to report on the priorities that each of um, the committees, subcommittees have been working on. Um, as you report these recommendations, um, I know we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have 20 minutes per team per group. Each subcommittee will have 20 minutes per, per recommendation to work through. So as you present, then we'll have about 13 to 15 minutes for a conversation um, to take questions. And again, for those of you that are online, thank you for joining us. Um, you are welcome to submit your comments um, online. So as Caroline had, has already pointed out, uh, we will be voting at the end of the day. So all of the recommendations will be voted on one by one at the end, so we will not be breaking those up. So just please keep that in mind. Uh, important things, if you, are, if you would like to speak, just please put up your tent card. For those of you, um, for the commissioners that are on Zoom, if you wouldn't mind just raising, using your raise hand function, we will make sure we uh, are keeping track of that. And uh, remember to turn on your mic 
when you are speaking and turn off the mic when you are not speaking. Um, and that's the same for those of our colleagues on Zoom. Please make sure that when you are done speaking that you turn off your, um, your speaker, your, your mic, and that way we can make sure that we are having a conversation and not hearing all the background. So uh, we will try to incorporate our Zoom colleagues, our colleagues, uh, our commissioners on Zoom, because we want to make sure we can keep integrated. In the new world that we live in, we can be both. And I, if you see me keep continuing to turn around, uh, it will be me trying to keep track of and making sure I'm paying attention to the hands on Zoom. So with that, Let's go ahead and get started because it is important that we get moving. Um, and I am going to turn it over to Emily for the data disaggregation subcommittee to get started. So Emily, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Good morning and welcome. I wanna take this opportunity to thank Ambassador Tai, Secretary Pracera, Erika Morizuku, Crystal Kai, and the dedicated Wiampi team. The co-chairs of the data disaggregation committee are Sarah Min, Dr. Reno Samoa, and Dr. Robert Underwood. In addition to myself, Kai Ying Yang is also a member. The non-commissioned members are Dr. Nines Ponce and Dr. Joseph Kiave Kahalukula. Our DFO is Sarah Edwards. I also want to share and include marks from the Federal Register Notice. Our committee heard and agreed with what the committee, community has said and with the key topics of agreement being on community engagement, multi-pronged approach to gathering data, and collecting data at the geographical level to include community-specific data. Our priority issue areas are ensure equitable data inclusion through data collection, analyzing and reporting data, especially for underrepresented AA and NHPI populations. Facilitate improved access for community advocates to use federal agency data to more effectively inform policy changes. Foster impactful three-way dialogue between communities, academic researchers, and federal agencies for more consistent reporting. Pursue joint recommendations with other subcommittees, including health equity, language access, and belonging inclusion, anti-Asian hate, and anti-discrimination. Call for the investigation of more accurate methods and strategies to capture ethnocultural language and multiracial identity characteristics for AA and NHPI communities. Lastly, highlight best practices from priority federal agencies for data disaggregation. We had two presenters, two presentations. The first from the U.S. Census Bureau. They presented an overview of the U.S. Census Bureau's Office of Strategic Alliance, as well as their outreach strategies to reach AA and NHPI communities and facilitate data sharing. We heard from Anna Owens, Deputy Chief, Office of Strategic Alliance, U.S. Census Bureau, U.S. Department of Commerce. Miami Hairston Escalante, Partner Liaison, Office of Strategic Alliance, U.S. Census Bureau, U.S. Department of Commerce. Nicole Scalinganello, Assistant Division Chief for Communications, American Community Survey Office, U.S. Census Bureau, U.S. Department of Commerce. And Bina Kawe Mosman Safi, Branch Chief, Congressional Affairs Office, Office of Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs, U.S. Census Bureau, U.S. Department of Commerce. Our second presentation was from Neil Ware, President and Founder, Equally American. Kara Brumfield, Associate Director, Center on Poverty and Inequality, Georgetown Law. J. June Lee, Policy and Data Analyst, Center on Poverty and Inequality, Georgetown Law. They presented on advancing data equity in the U.S. territories. At this time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Robert Underwood for our recommendation. Just quickly, um, all commissioners, when you are speaking into the microphone, can you move the microphone closer to you so our colleagues on Zoom can hear us too? Half a day, and uh, to all of you, uh, Watching from Guam, good evening, and good morning to the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> of the five uh, U.S. territories, only Puerto Rico receives more state-like treatment in the federal statistical system as a result of a 1992 presidential memorandum signed by President George H.W. Bush. The other U.S. territories, American Samoa, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, are not included in the federal statistical system. 
This disproportionately and unfairly excludes the people living in those territories from essential statistical data on housing, labor force participation, demographic changes, and environmental challenges, which in turn excludes these people from visibility in policy making, political representation, and some $1.5 trillion in federal funding that is issued based on this statistical data. The recommendation and uh, the chart here that you see is has been prepared by the uh, by uh, Equally American and the Georgetown uh, Center on Inequality and Poverty. As you can see, uh, our recommendation is to that the White House issue an executive order that gives the U.S. territories at least comparable treatment to Puerto Rico in the standards, policies, and norms in federal departments and agencies regarding the treatment of U.S. territories in the statistical system. The five U.S. territories, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, the Northern Marianas, and American Samoa, equal 3.6 million people or the equivalent of the five smallest U.S. states combined. Despite this large population, the U.S. territories are largely neglected in a variety of federal, federal statistical systems. There are four primary surveys contributing to population, household, and workforce data. Of these four data sets, the U.S. territories are only represented in one, the decennial census. The exception to this is Puerto Rico, which is in, represented in three of the four surveys due to the more state-like treatment granted in President George H.W. Bush's 1992 memorandum. The overwhelming majority of the populations of the remaining territories represent minority communities, and the three Pacific Island territories are overwhelmingly AA and NHPI populations. The level of, this level of exclusion is simultaneously a racial justice, an equity issue, and a political status issue. The data from these surveys are used to inform policy in areas of housing, education, health care, and political representation, amongst other key issues. Further, this data is used to determine allocations for federal funding exceeding $1.5 trillion. Subsequently, the absence of data denies the territories the ability to access data on their economic, health care, education, public migration, and social vulnerability indices, which has had dramatic impacts on policy making. For example, the failure to include territories in the other data sets affects the allocation of housing programs, road construction, employment programs, and most notably, and especially important to us, response to climate change. Additionally, the exclusion from federal data paves the way to exclusion from private data collections and reporting. Recently, Implan, which is a private firm that conducts economic impact research, announced that they will no longer include the Pacific Island territories due to the inadequacy of the census-generated economic data. In 2021, President Biden declared that there can be no second-class citizens in the United States of America and signed the executive order uh, 14031, which solidified his commitment to equitable, disaggregated data for the AA and NHPI community, and we urge that a new executive order be granted in order to ensure equity in disaggregated data. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. And I think this is um, so glad to see this recommendation, but I wanted to open it up for comments uh, from our commissioners. Thanks. I am blown away. Uh, I'm, I am shocked that this is not going on, and thank you so much for this recommendation. Really needed fully support. Daniel? Quick question. Are you aware, or is anyone aware of any justifications for these territories' exclusion? 
the, in general, the Census Bureau might argue that the, the populations are so small that it is difficult to uh, collect data. But I think that uh, in this case, uh, the, the priority should be policy over uh, statistical uh, analysis, the, the, the ease of statistical analysis. So I think uh, uh, for many years that has been the uh, commonly stated refrain. So uh, it's, it's uh, especially important for us because if you can imagine the way that, uh, that federal programs are allocated. And so uh, we don't know uh, what our uh, unemployment rates are. We have no way of knowing that and, uh, and the, the uh, census data is not helping us. So uh, uh, there was an attempt to provide legislation uh, for this uh, last year, but of course it ended with that Congress. Are there other comments? Again, I think such an important well, time to be doing this and so important that we do collect data because it drives data collection at state, local, every other level based on how that is done. So really important. Thanks. All right. If there are no other questions, we are All going right. to... On behalf of the A team, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. Thank you for the recommendation, and thank you for all the hard work in the committee. I know this took a lot of time and really appreciate. Uh, this is also coming out of a previous commission conversation, so really appreciate the recommendation. All right. Um, we are going to keep moving then. Uh, the Language Access Subcommittee. Uh, Victoria, I believe you are going to take the lead for us here. Yes, that's right. Um, Hartfield, thanks to the White House Initiative and the White House um, Ambassador Tai and Secretary Becerra um, and the commissioners um, just for all the incredible recommendations so far. Um, I'm Victoria Wynn. I'm honored to be here and provide the report out for the Language Access Subcommittee. Um, the subcommittee includes seven commissioners and uh, an ex officio member. Uh, Co-chairs include myself, Victoria Wynn, Dr. Amy Abayani, and also Dr. Kimberly Chang. And we're joined by Commissioners Carrie Doy, Commissioner Grace Huang, Commissioner Ajay Batoria, who's joining us virtually, and Commissioner Simon Pang joining us virtually as well. And our ex officio member is Laureen uh, Lagaran. And um, special thanks to our DFO, Zan Wu. Um, and I would be remiss if we don't acknowledge the contributions from our former uh, non-commissioner, Diana Zhang. Um, and then, so the next slide talks about our priority issue areas, um, and these are the areas that we're operating under, working with other subcommittees, as well as incorporating feedback from the community. And we have seven priority issue areas. Uh, the first is to improve language access in the justice system, increase public outreach, and that includes the distribution of language access information out to our communities in languages our communities can understand. Um, the third is improve language access funding for healthcare. Um, these include centers, clinics, and other areas that are affiliated with funding from the federal government to serve limited English proficient LEP families. And the fourth is prioritizing and expanding federal funding, and that's funding for AA and HPI language access, including all the vital services that come with um, accessible uh, services in the language arena. And then the next is build a pipeline for language interpreters and um, uh, translators and having um, in-house staff, right? Um, and the incentives uh, to keep that workforce in place and then also to move more people in the pipeline. And then we have translating federal agency communications. And if we've seen all the federal um, websites, they're right now in English and in Spanish. Uh, there may be other materials there, but you know, our recommendations are looking at multiple languages for the ANHPI communities across the different federal agencies. And last but not least is uh, about data disaggregation, collecting and analyzing this data, but specifically around languages within limited English proficient um, populations. And during the past few months, uh, we've invited uh, speakers and uh, ma uh, subject matter experts to come and join us. Uh, the first is Kenan Hahn. He's a senior program manager with the Asian Pacific Institute for Gender-Based Violence, um, API GBV, and he provided information on language access, um, the challenges and barriers of our AA and H NHPI limited English proficient communities, um, and shared recommendations based on the implementation of Title VI um, in the state and local government. 
And then next we had Dr. Keiki Kawai Ai A, Director of Kahaka Ula O Ke Alikolani College of Hawaiian Language. So for my Hawaiian commissioners, I hope I did that justice. <laughs> University of Hawaii at Hilo, a member of the Native Educator Education Committee of the National Indian Education Association. She also serves as a board member of the World's Indigenous Nations Higher Education Consortium. We had a great conversation and she provided background on the history of the Native Hawaiian language preservation work and how, um, the, with the efforts of the current language revitalization. We learned so much about the programs, the funding, and the federal support um, that exists, and also the recommendations for more support for the language promotion and preservation. And then we also uh, were joined by Stanton Inamoto, Senior Program Director of the Office of Native Hawaiian Relations, U.S. Department of Interior. We learned a lot about the relationship between the Native Hawaiian community and the federal government. Um, and she shared a lot of information and current uh, federal efforts to incorporate Native Hawaiian language um, and perspectives to the Department of Interior's work. And last um, but not least, we also had the uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, through SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, and we learned a lot about the background, the structure of the basic operations of the very important and vital services of 98 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Um, and the information about the current interpretation and language options for 98. Because I'm sure folks are asking, well, how is our A&H, AA and HPI community accessing the service that is nationally um, available? And we heard from the director, Monica Johnson, from 988 and Behavioral Health and Crisis Coordinating Office, as well as the deputy director, um, John um, Palmieri. Um, and the division director of James Wright. Um, and through these um, conversations, we were able to um, incorporate a lot of the recommendations into our recommendations this round, as well as for future recommendations. So we have one recommendation to put forward, and I'll pass it over to Commissioner Ajay Butorio, um, who's on virtual. Ajay, we have some language, I mean, some sound issues with. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you all hear me? We yes, can, we, we can, can hear, hear you. you. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, okay. Lee, Erika Motosugu, Sonal Shah, and our amazing DFOs, Carolyn, Sarah, Zayn, and uh, good morning. I'm grateful to all our fellow commissioners. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to let me present this uh, recommendation. So this recommendation around 988 Suicide and Crisis Helpline only offers support in English and Spanish, which may not be accessible to all individuals in the United States. Let me give you some background and rationale. The 988 <coughs> Suicide and uh, Crisis Hotline is a vital source for individuals experiencing mental health crisis and offers the most comprehensive mental health support in the country. It is an essential tool for all individuals in emotional distress to ac access crucial help and support. The creation of 988 is a once in a lifetime opportunity to strengthen and expand the lifeline and transform America's behavioral health crisis care system to the one that saves lives by serving anyone at any time from anywhere. And what we want to add is in any language across the nation and aims to providing needed evaluation and crisis intervention in the community wherever possible and better meet the behavioral health needs of all people experiencing crisis. <clears throat> Uh, one of the reason, you know, uh, uh, our subcommittee, uh, we have uh, personally seen, uh, you know, uh, examples, of many unfortunate incidents. Uh, in a few weeks back, there was a student who jumped off from the Golden Gate Bridge and ended his life. There was a student who ended a, his life in a dorm, dormitory by hanging uh, herself. And, and, and many students I listened to and heard them from, they're not able to access mental health crisis, mental health support, um, you know, because the ratio of uh, teachers to me mental health counselors to uh, is one is to 400 
in, in terms of student and uh, mental health counselor ratio. So this lifeline is available to anyone, anywhere, and, uh, and, and providing support who can reach out for stigma, to reduce the stigma around surrounding mental health and substance use issues. So with this, I will uh, so look at the recommendation, which I am not able to see on my screen. Um, give me one second. If it can be brought on the screen, Caroline, the recommendation. Could you please share the recommendation on the screen so I can? Ajay, it's on the screen already. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, I for in my Zoom I'm not able to see it. So let me download, open the presentation. Uh, it will take me a minute. Uh, on the Zoom I'm not able to see it. So uh, Ajay, can I recommend that Victoria go ahead and read the recommendation that's on the screen? Ajay, would that be okay if yeah, I read I the recommendation? Okay. I got it. Yeah. So the recommendation says that the commission recommends expanding the availability and access to 988 through providing language assistance services in multiple AA and NHPI languages and expanding outreach to AA and NHPI communities. By 2024, SAMSHA should develop a national action plan with regional languages, specificity to expand the capacity of the 988 suicide and crisis helpline to provide 24 by seven live in language counseling services in the top A and HPI languages, in addition to interpretation services, and increasing resources to community-based A and HPI organizations that can serve languages of lesser diffusion. Next recommendation. By September 2023, SAMSA should translate 988 materials in web and web pages, social media, listserv announcements, and public outreach materials into top A and HPI languages consistent with the HHS equity action plan to address the inequities causing underutilization of 988 lifeline by A and HPI populations. Last, by September 2023, SAMHSA should partner with federal agencies, including the US Department of Education, to focus on youth outreach in schools and colleges, as well as A and HPI community organizations and media to promote the 988 service and the availability of mental health services. So with this, I, you know, with this recommendation, the subcommittee uh, request that converting the line, uh, offering the service in multiple ANHPA languages would help to reduce the stigma surrounding mental health and substance use within the ANHPA communities. Many people may be reluctant to seek help for these issues due to cultural or language barriers and providing support in their own language could encourage more people to seek the help they need. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I think for those of you that were watching online, mm -hmm. just note that Ajay just went in a slightly different order than what's on the screen, but it's the same, it's the same material. So please, uh, please, write, please note that. I'm gonna, uh, I would like to open it up to our commissioners. I see Louisa has her card up uh, for any questions or comments. Uh, hi, I really support this recommendation from language access, but I did have a question. There is Title VI in this country where documents, language access is supposed to be available. Did any of the speakers address that, like why they didn't implement Title VI in their own agency? Um, so from the speakers that we did hear from, I don't think we had... Um, a direct response about Title VI, but we did hear that uh, we had some questions about uh, the language access that were happening in the regional areas. I know the 988 team did um, share uh, that there were uh, regions that had better uh, access to services just because of the organizations that were available that provided the language access support. Um, but we're definitely going to make note about, um, you know, I guess as we further discuss the recommendations or further recommendations to ensure that, you know, Title VI is being implemented, especially um, in the area of um, access to mental health services and crisis lines. No, I, I just think it's really important, you know, that we um, bring it up and hold the federal government agencies accountable. I mean, these are laws that got enacted years ago. 
and for them not to enact it, it really says something, and that it takes a commission in 2021, or whenever we were appointed, whenever we were appointed to bring this up, right? And I think the um, strategic plan that was submitted to President Biden, I think it's on all of us to make sure that, okay, is this being Im implemented, right? But thank you so much for raising it. Okay, Dr. Underwood. Uh, I, of course, I uh, very much endorse this plan, and, and one of the things that we learned in terms of the public input, uh, even uh, that uh, we paid attention to for the Data Disaggregation Committee, is that there's an intersection between uh, language use and geography, and so that, you know, sometimes uh, these things are analyzed on a na nationwide basis, and some, language, some languages are ve very small in number, but in certain regions or in certain areas, they're very large in number. And so uh, I think there should be some attention to that in the intersection between uh, geography and, and, uh, and ethnic data and language use, which uh, sometimes is masked by just looking at it at a national level. So when they say, we're only going to do the 10 most uh, common languages or we're going to do 15 most common languages, you'll find that in some areas of the country, uh, the most common languages are not in those 15. And so that, that's an important uh, aspect to remember. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. Uh, Mia. Uh, I was actually going to uh, talk a little bit about what uh, uh, Robert just uh, mentioned. Um, I definitely support uh, the um, uh, translation um, and interpretation uh, uh, for 9A. I think also um, being able to track where um, we are not. Uh, providing those uh, specific languages in different regions, uh, uh, like he said, is going to be important to understand where we aren't um, providing those services. Um, and then also um, pushing for not just the minimum um, it is also important. I know on here it's it's pretty broad in saying uh, interpret in more AA and, and, and HPI. Um, languages, but I wonder if we should uh, push um, farther on that and saying like uh, regionally it should be like translated in specific uh, languages and then um, depending on the, the percentage of usage and then also um, wondering if um, uh, if there's a specific reason, um, uh, like Louisa said, uh, in why they're not utilizing those languages uh, in those areas, if there's no service providers that are in that area that do it in those specific languages, then that's another issue uh, unto itself. Great point. Um, Grace. I was going to somewhat echo what Mia just uh, raised, but one of the things in response to Luisa's question is that you know the national agency contracts with local organizations to provide the service in terms of who's calling, and so to the extent that those local organizations have that capacity, um, there I think is more need for positive support, I guess, or pressure to make sure that those agencies have that capacity. And at the same time, you know, as somebody who works in a field where when you're talking about mental health issues, I mean, the providers all hopefully at a minimum have the capacity to use interpreters or translation services, you know, when they're talking to people on the phone. But ideally, uh, I would hope there would be more support for actual um, mental health providers or trained staff that speak that language fluently and are able to, you know, develop that rapport in, with folks who are calling. And so uh, there's there's a long way to go in terms of our mental health resources generally across the country. And then um, this additional layer is, is important in terms of highlighting the need for uh, trained staff that have that capacity as well as cultural competence. Thank you. Um, completely support uh, and in alignment with the health 
equity committee, I think we understand the growing need around mental health um, services and the growing need for that uh, across the country. I also just wanted to note for the record and for committee, uh, appreciate you welcoming both Stanton Inamoto and um, our representative from the community college uh, so that we can also talk about, while not directly related to this, the need for Native Hawaiian language preservation um, and support for those services moving forward. Mahalo. Thank you, Michelle. Aijen? Uh, I also really support this recommendation, and um, and I know this is about the entry point is language access, but I do think that there is a way in which um, meeting young people where they are is a larger question, obviously, than just language. And, um, and so just in the point about how we do this outreach, um, how we're leveraging the fact that young people are on social and they're just fine, you know, meeting people where they are, I think is gonna be as essential as the language access. And so um, just wondering if the committee heard from any of the speakers about that or had any conversation about that in the context of this recommendation. Uh, so this work is intersectional with the Health Equity Committee subcommittee, and um, we did hear in the Health Equity subcommittee, and I think you'll hear a recommendation about that from Commissioner Ives Rubley. Thank you. Smita? Thank you. Um, I, this is a great recommendation. It's, it's sort of an interesting one, especially today as our president is in Monterey Park and we're thinking about, you know, and, I, and clearly as we have another recommendation coming through the health equity on, on um, youth um, mental health as well. It's, it's um, the language access is, you know, I think, I, Jen, I like the way you formulated, it's an entry point, right? To making sure that people start to seek these treatments. And, you know, especially in any community, we have a sort of a, there's not always this comfort level that it's okay to be seeking mental health support. And by having this language access available, it's, it, it in one sense also destigmatizes it for our community. So I know that there was a, another point made in, that'll be addressed in the, in the youth one that it's also the number one cause of um, death in, in young people. And so having all of these options available, just starting to make these small steps are not small steps, they're big steps because they start to open the doors to solving a problem. So thank you for doing this. Thank you, Smita. Kevin? I just think that this is a great opportunity to be able to talk a little bit about 988 service because I'll be honest, I'd never heard of it until this recommendation was brought up. And I think based on some of the back and forth, I think it could be a little confusing for people in the audience just listening in exactly how it works because part of the conversation was about it getting connected to regional services at the same time. So is the recommendation really that if I were to call 988 that there would be a direct person who is a mental health counselor who can in language help me? Or is it that 988 would say, where are you calling from? Are you in New York City? And then they would connect me to the regional New York City mental health services, suicide prevention. And so are we talking about directing dollars to, for example, in that case, New York City's suicide prevention, mental health services? Or are we talking about 988 having their own cadre of in, per, in language mental health experts? No, that's a great question, Kevin. Um, you know, when we invited 988 to come and speak, um, we did fire off a lot of questions because we wanted to understand. I know that not everyone uh, was familiar with the 988, especially during the rollout nationally. Um, we did learn that um, there was a regional approach, right, with calling the 988 uh, number. It did get dispatched um, to um, uh, wherever you're, you're, you're calling from in the region. Uh, we do understand that in the region, not all regions are created equally. There are you know, uh, regions with more partners with language capacities in some, but we also understand that there was also a national kind of a backup, right, in the event that um, individuals were making phone calls and they were not connected with local, and there was an opportunity to connect with um, 
uh, on the phone interpreters as well. Um, I know that's still kind of a, a work in progress with connecting, uh, from my understanding, um, with uh, languages that may not be available in the region. Um, and I'll open the floor uh, for Commissioner Ajay Batorio or Kim to. Caller, it, it would be transparent. When he calls, uh, he, uh, based on where he's calling from, the 988 service will direct his call to the regional network, but the caller will get the service what he needs uh, and uh, to support him in through the mental health crisis and uh, any other help they need. So. Kimberly, you're gonna. Yeah, so so actually it's it's three different parts, uh, uh, Kevin. Um, the first part is that we want the materials translated, you know, on the website, the written materials. The second part is we heard from the 988 service that, you know, when, when they rolled it out, they, they only had like six, was it 60? 60 calls from AA and NHPI communities. And we asked them, well, you know, the calls should mirror what the prevalence is in terms of the, the mental health and, and the needs within the community and why is it not? What do you think are the barriers? And some of those barriers came out that, um, you know, they haven't done enough outreach necessarily within our communities. Um, when, when people call, uh, they only have the live mental health trained counselors in English and Spanish. The rest is used through a, a life um, language line interpreter service. And then as uh, uh, Commissioner Wynn noted, it gets regionally dispatched. Um, and then there's regional geographic uh, barriers to that as well in, in the, the, the time zones and when people are available. And then the, the third thing is that um, wanting to connect with the Department of Education and Commissioner Batoria was very, very clear that this is very much needed to get that outreach into the youth. As uh, Commissioner Pooh mentioned, meeting the youth where they're at. So it's a kind of a multi-part thing with many barriers that we're trying to address. Um, I hope Kaying, are you, did you put your note down or are you? Uh, I did, okay. but can I say Please. something? Yeah. I really um, appreciate adding the youth uh, portion and working with schools. Um, I feel, um, I, I know this is a very specific recommendation and uh, I know there's a lot of context and complexity uh, when we work with our communities. And um, I think being an education advocate for a long time, um, Asian American young people are still often invisible. And um, I think part of this is really because of the lack of data, right? And that the data often says that we're the model minority. Um, so I, I just wanted to add that. But I also want to say that um, I wonder if in the future or if you've discussed community engagement because a lot of the CBOs that are working with youth actually have better training and preparedness uh, to work with young people in our communities. And so how is 988 service uh, connecting with those uh, community-based organizations? Because just having someone who speak the language but is not well trained or understand the community could also be very problematic and have a bad negative impact on uh, young people and communities that uh, don't necessarily uh, work um, with uh, the mainstream community. So I just wanted to add that. I mean, we don't have to discuss it here today, but it's something to think about, and I'm sure that you've discussed it in your uh, committee as well, too. So thank you very much. I really um, look forward to seeing how this can be implemented. Victoria. And I also want to, um, you know, uh, share some spotlight uh, for the caregivers and family members as well who may be limited English proficient that may need additional resources, um, you know, to share with their family member that maybe is going through a crisis situation. Um, and I just wanted to kind of uplift that too because I know um, that's something that we often don't, um, you know, speak about or bring to the table, um, especially the family members and the caregivers who are um, there to offer support or part of that support system. So I'm going to close the discussion on this, but just to say, I think um, important recommendation. I do think I think you all heard from everyone that this is sort of a first step into, uh, and I know there's a second recommendation coming on youth and mental health. But uh, just summarize like three big points here. One, um, the data, the data, and knowing where the communities are and which communities are being affected, and using that data effectively will matter on which language is also important. Um, 
uh, to uh, really thinking about where we find people and making sure people in our own communities even know about 988, that that in itself is also a challenge and making sure that that's available and, and especially for the youth, like where are they and how are they finding it? And then, and then really thinking about the, and the sort of many of it, many of the lines along the lines were around community engagement, but, um, but also recognizing the Native Hawaiian uh, component and making sure that we're, we're looking at not just a, a NHPI, but also looking at the Native Hawaiian portion of it and, and, and ensuring that the communities uh, in the Native Hawaiian community also have access. So um, with that, I'm going to close out this uh, particular. Thank you for all the great comments. Thank you for all the great work that has been done on this. It's such an important opportunity. I think 988 is an important um, a first step into ensuring and, and helping those that are in crisis uh, with mental health.